All right, welcome to part one of the South Asia test tutorials. I'm going to be going through the review with the help of some visual aids. Number one asks about the Himalayas. The Himalayas serve as a natural boundary between India and China, and they include the countries of Nepal and Bhutan. The Himalayas were formed when, over a period of millions of years, the Indian subcontinent floated up until it collided with the Asian continent and it formed the Himalaya Mountains. So it was formed by tectonic activity. Monsoons are seasonal winds, and in the winter, those winds come over the Himalayas, meaning that the air is very dry. But in the summer months, the wind comes over the Indian Ocean, which means that those winds bring a lot of rain. That rain means that there is a lot of flooding that can happen in the summer, which brings a lot of destruction to the low-lying areas of India and especially to Bangladesh. This is an image of some of the flooding that can occur in the Ganges River Delta, in which the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers flow into the Bay of Bengal at Bangladesh, there is a particularly large amount of flooding, and that can be very destructive for Bangladesh since they have a very dense population. In terms of climate, uh, we have a few different climate types going on. Now, it's going to be very tropical overall. And in India, it's going to be uh, tropical, mostly. Pakistan is going to be much drier. But in Nepal and Bhutan, since they are in the Himalayas, are going to have a highland climate. Anytime you're in the mountains, you are going to find a highland climate. There are a few major rivers in South Asia. You have to know the Indus River, the Ganges River, and the Brahmaputra River. The Indus River flows into the Indian Ocean. The Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers flow through Bangladesh into the Bay of Bengal. The river that has a religious significance is the Ganges. The Ganges River was thought to be the birthplace of a goddess in the Hindu religion, which gives the Ganges very much significance religiously. The area that you see shaded in gray is the Indo-Gangetic Plain, which is the very fertile farmland that exists all along the Ganges River and parts of the Indus River. This is going to be where most of the agriculture is able to take place since it has the most fertile farmland. Since it also has the most fertile farmland, it's also going to have the most people. So this is going to be the most densely populated part of South Asia. Notice that that takes up most of the country of Bangladesh, which is why Bangladesh is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. This is an image of people bathing in the Ganges. Since the Ganges is thought to have such a large significance in the Hindu religion, people will bathe in it regularly. And in class, you learned about some of the other interesting things that they do in the Ganges River. This is an aerial view of the country in South Asia called the Maldives. You notice all of those things on the water there. Those are low-lying islands called atolls. The Maldives is made up of over 1,200 small islands, which makes the Maldives an archipelago. Global warming is a particular threat to an archipelago like the Maldives. Global warming means that ocean levels are gradually rising. And since these islands are low-lying, which means they don't come very far up over the water level, if the ocean levels rise even just slightly, then many of these islands can find themselves underwater. A cyclone is a tropical storm, so it's similar to what we would call a hurricane in this part of the world. In that part of the world, they call it a cyclone. It can be just as devastating as a hurricane can be in this part of the world. A cyclone that was particularly deadly just hit the South Pacific Ocean. So just in the news last week, we've been seeing some pretty damaging effects from tropical storms called cyclones. The most pressing problem facing South Asia today is overpopulation. 
the population rates in many South Asian countries is going up very, very rapidly. Family sizes are extremely large. And so this population pyramid points out Bangladesh, which we see has a such a high population growth rate that it can be devastating to a country which isn't really wealthy enough or developed enough to withstand such a growing population. There simply aren't enough resources to deal with such a high population. The Hindu religion is the one we studied in this unit because the majority of India practices Hinduism. Hinduism is a polytheistic religion, which means that they worship thousands of gods and goddesses in Hinduism. That's very different from the religions in the last unit, which were monotheistic and only believed in worshiping one god. Central to the Hindu religion is the idea of reincarnation. Reincarnation means that after you die, your soul will be reborn into another body. The concept of karma means that the deeds that you do on earth will come back to you in some form. And so you try to live a good life on earth and build up good karma. So when you are reincarnated, you are reincarnated as something good. The caste system is a social classification system that is a big part of the Hindu religion. Society is broken into different levels or classes known as castes. You are born into your caste and you cannot move castes unless you are reincarnated into a different caste. Caste will determine everything in life. It will determine where you are allowed to live, what job you will have, and who you are allowed to marry. You're going to find traditional ideas like this more common in rural areas. Since the caste system is outlawed today in India, you're not going to find it in the major urban areas. It's only going to be in the rural areas of India where you will see people still holding on to this caste belief. The lowest level of the caste system is the untouchables. These are the people that are complete outcasts of society. Gandhi is one of the most important people in world history. He was responsible for bringing independence to India from Great Britain. He practiced the idea of non-violent resistance, which means that he used methods to achieve independence like boycotts that he did of British cloth. He boycotted uh, buying British salt by leading the salt march. He told people not to enroll their children in British schools, and he told people that they should live life as an Indian person and not necessarily as a British colonist. Through this belief of nonviolence, he was able to achieve independence for India in 1947, and he has had a huge influence on leaders since then, most notably Martin Luther King Jr., who used nonviolent resistance to lead the civil rights movement in the United States. I'm going to continue in a separate video that will continue with number 12 on your review and will take you through the end.